food processors here who uh, send who distribute food pretty much worldwide. We have uh, honey producers and tofu producers and yogurt producers and uh, grain producers. And uh, we, uh, <coughs> with the climate that we have and the natural resources that we have as far as agricultural land, there's no reason for us to not spend a lot of time and energy developing food to be a, a source of export, a source of jobs in, in the southern Willamette Valley. We're right on the verge of it, and I'd like to uh, compliment the uh, um, Lane County Economic Department, which uh, Glenda Poling uh, is uh, at the helm of right now and doing a very good job of bringing things together. So I'm, I'm really excited about the, fu 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 he the future. He hasn't even over there yet, and he's already working it. <laughs> 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 it's, I it's better than the alternative. <laughs> 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 and, and this, it, it was an offshoot of, uh, of all food, and I'm, I'm very interested in food <laughs> on a regular <laughs> basis. <laughs> as food is my <laughs> life. <laughs> So, so it's, uh, once again, we have a, a bright future. I, I believe lots of jobs on the horizon. I'm interested in food shows. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Sorry, Pat. <laughs> this has turned to slapstick, so the food fight begins in 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Betty. You could have the chicken I didn't eat out there. <laughs> All duck. Um, is it duck? Um, yeah, I agree that we should. That's why we should protect our farmlands, because food is important and our local food source is important. Um, and we should protect the Amazon headwaters, which we still haven't done. <coughs> I brought this, this clipping from the connection, stormwater connection, which is about improving the water quality in the lower Amazon, but we still haven't protected the upper Amazon. And the water goes from there to the lower Amazon, to the Long Tom, to the Willamette. It affects, and it affects air and water. It, uh, if we allow housing up there. It will be more pollution, more fertilizer, um, pesticides, more impervious surface. That part of the creek is already, already exceeds the TMDL. I think it is total maximum daily load. And it's all, the temperature is already too high. So it's really important that we do something about that. It's been on the list for many years now. Um, and I don't know how much money's left in the park thing, but some people who heard that we were thinking about using part of the park acquisition money for um, a skate park were pretty upset by that. Um, and I, I've suggested, and some other people have said they think so too, that we could have a bond issue for park improvements if we include a skate park and if we include water features at other parks and things that people want in other parts of the city. I think people would work well for it because people really care about their parks. Um, I, I went on a tour with um, Ron Kilcon, LTD, to see the housing on each side of Amazon, of, of West 11th, the housing on the other side of the Amazon Creek, and where they're planning to build some bridges, and it was very interesting. I still haven't made up my mind what I think, but, um, and I think something else I was concerned about, but it's gone away, so we'll, I'll pass it on to Michael. Okay, Mike. Michael, either way, that's good. <laughs> uh, I just <laughs> wanted to say... You look um, so dignified today. Oh, thank you. I just <laughs> <laughs> wanted to say how proud I was to go and attend the uh, uh, Eugene Police Officers Awards Ceremony the other day. Uh, in the mm -hmm. At a time when there are plenty of stories about people facing difficult things and making bad choices. <clears throat> it's kind of nice to spend an hour in the afternoon listening to people, listening to stories about people who make amazing choices to help other people and to put their own lives on the line in the process, both officers and civilians that got awards for that as well. Mm -hmm. And to hear, you know, some, some stories of un uncommon bravery and uncommon caring about the rest of the folks in our community. and so. Um, and I, it was just a, I was really pleased to spend an hour that afternoon to do that and be amongst those fine folks. So congratulations to those officers who got decades worth of service awards, as well as the ones with their commendations. Thank you. George. Uh, a couple of things. Um, Wednesday at 5 o'clock, the mayor and I will be at Albertsons on Coburg Road for the one-on-one -on -one that the mayor has been doing. And then Thursday at 3 o'clock, um, Lieutenant Rex Barong is retiring, and they're having a little ceremony for him in the uh, council chambers. And I just want to personally thank uh, Lieutenant Barong for all the years of service that he's uh, he's given to our community. 
And um, I would give you a report on the Travel Lane County Board meeting, but since we had the joint elected officials meeting on the ambulance task force, uh, I missed the uh, the meeting. So, but I think the the main focus of the meeting was preparing the budget because there was talk of using some of the um, uh, transit room tax <coughs> for the county budget. But as it turned out. Um, I think they received the county received some legal advice on the use of that, so it, uh, it they they didn't take any of the money that would have gone to traveling county to promote tourism in our community, which is probably one of the biggest economic drivers right now in in, in Lane County. So that was I think going to be the main focus of the of the topic. And other than that, uh, we had a Northeast Neighborhood Association meeting. The second I think it was the second or third one. Yeah, where they discuss some of the upcoming um, projects that are going on and some uh, um, different developments that are happening within the within the area. It's uh, there's going to you know there's going to be a lot of uh, activity in that north end of the northeast end of town in the next couple of years. It's going to be exciting up there. Chris, thanks. Uh, the only thing I would uh, remind folks is we did have the JEO meeting last Thursday where we talked about ambulance services and it was actually a very uh, good meeting because we are really starting to have to confront some difficult situations with regarding to funding that, not just for our jurisdiction but for all of them and it's something we're really going to have to deal with it's a very critical service and so I appreciated um, all the work that was done to go into um, preparing that report and I was pleased to see um, all the uh, joint elected officials turning out for that meeting to talk about that issue felt like some move forward huh yeah Alan uh, a couple items. Uh, on the way over here, I heard an interesting thing on NPR. It was, uh, I think, called the, might have got this wrong, but the Income Mobility Project did a study of, uh, and kind of uh, debunked the uh, myth that we are economically mobile in this society in that, uh, especially in comparison to other societies, we are less likely, if you're lower middle income, to uh, move up in in your income class than we are um, Western European countries and Canada, which sort of surprised me because the mythology is that we have a lot of that mobility going around, but it's uh, um, uh, a lot of countries do it better than we do, and I think that's something we should bear in mind and try to fix if we could. Um, tonight, at uh, after this meeting, I uh, might leave a little early, but uh, Fairmont Neighborhoods having a meeting at Laurel Hill Laurel Wood Golf Course from 7 to 9 p.m. Uh, talk about the um, the uh, Olympics, the Olympic trials, and how that's impacting the neighborhood. Um, on Sunday, June 10th, the uh, at the library at 3 p.m. is a, a movie that's being shown called Bag It. And it's about uh, plastic bags, and uh, again, that's Sunday, June 9th at the library, 3 p.m. Uh, it's free, so if anyone wants to go, uh, uh, they can join me there. Um, I had a Laurel Hill Valley Neighbors meeting the other week at the same time I had the Sustainability Commission meeting, so I managed to do a little bit of both and do a little tap dancing. And then um, kind of a, a, a moment of pride, my uh, my wife, Susie, got her Master Gardener's badge the All other right. day, along with 85 Sweet. other people yeah. who um, graduated from the class. It's a uh, having watched it from a, a little bit of afar, it's quite a taxing and, and um, uh, um, a rigorous thing that they go through, and then they have to do a whole bunch of community service. So, uh, kind of a friend of mine called it the badgering mm -hmm. <laughs> when you get your badge, but you get this little uh, orange badge <laughs> that signifies you're a master gardener. Uh, and I guess there are 785 of them that are lifetime members of lifetime badges, which means they've donated more than a thousand hours of volunteer time. And there's oh. like over 700 of those in this community. So um, <coughs> gardening's kind of big in this community. And, and uh, <coughs> that was, and, it, and, it, and it's uh, an ongoing thing. So if you're interested <coughs> in doing that, um, uh, please investigate it. It didn't, despite rumors, die uh, when the LSU Extension Service went away. It's still really uh, robust. George Brown. Um, on Wednesday, I also attended the um, Place of Word ceremony along with the mayor and the city manager and councilors Poling and Clark. It was a nice event. I agree with Councilor Clark. It was good to see people that are <laughs> doing good things for our community. Um, on Friday morning, um, along with the manager and the mayor and John Simpson from eWeb and a few other people, 
attended the, um, the groundbreaking ceremony for Stellar Housing Complex on City View. It's going to be, I cannot remember the exact numbers, but it's going to be housing, the really nice units. It's, it's a terrific wow. development. 50, 50, 50, 50 something. 50 units. It's mm. going to house about 150 people or 175 people, though. And four of the units are for homeless vets and their families. Ten of the units are for National Guard vets. Uh, are, are you know will be affordable housing for National Guard veterans and their families, and uh, it's right next to, just uh, north of 18th on City View. Uh, it's, that's just going to be a wonderful <coughs> project. Uh, and then on Friday or Saturday morning, um, had a uh, attended a weed eradication party at Civic Stadium <laughs> with the uh, Save Civic Stadium folks, and that's always a good. A good event to attend. It actually doesn't look so bad. I mean, I think all of our efforts have been paying off, and it looks uh, doesn't look as bad as it did say a couple of years ago. I guess that's about it. All right. See okay, um, Daddy, I remembered what else I wanted to talk about. Um, City Hall. We're vac and as you know, John, I've been writing you emails, but we're vacating it before we know what we're what's going to happen to it. And I'm really concerned about that. I think if, if it's going to be rehabilitated or rebuilt or whatever, that we should start this year instead of a year or two from now. I think, and if we're not doing anything, if we haven't even decided anything and we're moving out, then I can see this being another eyesore to take the place of the ones that have disappeared. And I hope that we will be hearing something about that very soon. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I won't be talking about City Hall tonight, but um, also in addition to Rex, who's retiring, there's a couple other people in the in the city organization that are retiring that have lots of years of service. So we're losing quite a bit of uh, um, memory, historical memory in our uh, organization this year. And some folks have done great work. Rex Barong, of course, Linda Phelps, also in the police department, will be retiring. And uh, she's done just a great job over the years in a variety of roles. Uh, Johnny Medlin is retiring here uh, uh, shortly. <clears throat> and so he also has uh, provided, I think, 30 plus years of service to the community and uh, through some really pretty neat times. Karen Brack, who is not retiring, but uh, one of our assistant chiefs, as you know, is uh, going to be uh, or has accepted a job back east uh, as part of her professional career, and so kudos to her. Yeah. Uh, Chief Groves has mentioned on numerous occasions in his career that of all the uh, operations uh, managers and chiefs that he's worked with, that she is the top that he's worked with. So she's done some great work there in the in the organization. So some others that are also uh, on to new adventures. Know how to feel about that? <laughs> Good for her. Yeah, yeah it's it, it's it's nice for them. Uh, we have uh, gaps to fill back in the organization, and you know our, you know we have uh, really talented staff. So uh, we hope that there are people that are pretty competitive that have the opportunity to also advance in their careers with that too. So and I guess that's just another way of saying that we are proud to grow really good right. professional people and send them from here out to other places uh, in many ways representing the good work of our community as they take on their new jobs. Yeah, so, and some uh, do that. So that yeah. is a positive too. So. All righty. So let's uh, move on to our work items of this evening. And um, the first one up is the Carmen Smith relicensing project. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor. And I'll just turn over to Sue for a brief introduction then over to Mike with eWeb to give us a little bit of a presentation. So I'm going to be really brief. Um, we're coming to talk about the Carmen Smith relicensing today. Um, this is a little bit different from what we would normally do, um, but we have a bond um, authorization approval on your consent calendar tonight. And since this is a rather large project with, um, you know, impact to the community, we thought you might be interested in just having the opportunity to see a little bit more about the project and be able to ask um, some questions. And you'll see us again. Um, at the 7.30 meeting. Mike McCann is the project manager, and so he's going to give the presentation. Thank you. So good evening, Mayor Piercy and counselors. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight a little bit about the Carmen Smith project. And as Sue pointed out, you're going to see it again tonight on the consent uh, calendar for the regular board meeting, the regular meeting. 
So I'm Mike McCann. I'm uh, eWeb's project manager for Carmen Smith Relicensing uh, Project. I've been in this position since 2009, uh, getting ready for implementation of the project, and we've been working towards that. And um, the Carmen Smith Project is eWeb's largest utility-owned generating resource. It's a hydroelectric project on the Upper Mackenzie. It received its initial license in 1958 and was commissioned in 1963. And this picture that you're looking at is from the uh, dedication in 1963. At that time, eWeb offered any citizen of Eugene who wanted a bus ride up to the project and a box lunch um, free trip. And the, uh, the wow. keynote speaker at the dedication was Oregon Governor Mark Hatfield. Wow. So we... Uh, Can you do that again? <laughs> unfortunately not. Um, the... Uh, so the project went online in 63 and uh, with a 50-year license issued in 58. That, that uh, license expired in 2008. So in 2002, we started the process of relicensing the Carmen Smith facility. The relicensing process is very prescriptive. It's laid out in the Code of Federal Regulations. We followed that with an application in 2006. And immediately after signing the application and submitting it, we started settlement negotiations with a bunch of other parties, mostly state and federal resource agencies and NGOs and three Native American tribes. Um, we submitted a settlement agreement as a supplement to our license in 2006, and we expect the new license to be issued for 50 years sometime soon. The end of 2012 would be perfect. Uh, just in sort of this magnitude of the Karma Smith Project, it provides about 15 percent of eWeb's generating needs. So it's about half of our own generation and about 15% of our total generation needs. That's roughly, on average, about enough power to power 16,000 homes. So here's the project. Um, it is along the Mackenzie Highway up just uh, this side of Clear Lake. What happens is water flows over Sahaley and Kusa Falls, and it flows into Carmen Diversion Dam. And at that point, we put water through the power tunnel. Um, we have a water right for the full flow of the Mackenzie. And at this time, we take all of the water we can put in the tunnel. We don't, have a, don't currently have a water requirement to release water from the diversion dam, although under the new license, we will for fish habitat. So there's a little bit of water that gets released from carbon diversion, usually when we have more water than goes in the tunnel, and so that spills over. And we store the water in Smith Dam until we need it to generate power. So we use Carmen to generate power when prices are high and demand is high, and that's usually from about 6 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. So you wake up, you get up, turn on your lights, uh, hop in the shower, and energy use in Eugene goes up. And so we generate power here during peak times, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. At the end of the day, everyone goes to sleep, and we turn off the, the uh, project and store the water till the next day. Um, then what uh, there is other streams that flow into Trail Bridge, which is a re-regulating reservoir down there. And then also, if you've ever been to Blue Pool uh, or Tamalich Falls, that hike um, goes along the Mackenzie. That water all flows into Trail Bridge Dam. And then below Trail Bridge, we release water. That's our re-regulating reservoir. It releases water 24-7, and that becomes the Mackenzie River, as you know it, uh, as it flows into uh, Mackenzie Bridge. So. My project team and I have been asked to implement the new FERC license once we get it, consistent with the settlement agreement and eWeb's legacy statement, core values, and policies. And that's what we've been working towards. The settlement parties that we worked with, here's a list of them. I mentioned there are a lot of state and federal agencies, um, three Native American tribes, and, and then a bunch of uh, NGOs, including national NGOs like American Whitewater and local NGOs like Cascadia Wildlands and Oregon Wild and the Mackenzie Fly Fishers. Um, so all these parties met almost weekly for uh, a year and a half to craft this settlement agreement. And then when we submitted it to FERC, it kind of says what we want to do to protect the natural environment and still generate power at Carmen over the course of the next 50 years. The schedule we're on, like I mentioned, we're hoping to get the license late this year um, or early next year. We're planning for major construction to start in 2014. So since 2009, when I took over, we started design. We've been working on designs for um, fish ladders, fish screens, and so on, rebuilding the powerhouses. And, um, and we did some smaller stuff, like we replaced a bridge, we replaced a whole bunch of power poles, and we're um, building some new facilities to help us with construction once we get going. But big construction is going to start in, two four, in 2014 um, and hopefully be done somewhere around 2018. Uh, we looked at 
the, uh, the economics, the social, and the environmental impacts of the project. We did this at the time of the settlement agreement, but then recently as part of an overall project evaluation, we looked at the TBL um, for the project. And what we want to point out is that Karma Smith is very important to eWeb from a generating standpoint. It allows us to keep rates in Eugene as low as they are because we use it during peak power when power prices are at their highest. That's when we generate. At the same time, through the improvements in the settlement agreement, we're going to be adding fish passage to help the aquatics and help the native fisheries. We're going to be moving a substation off of the river, off of the Mackenzie River, and that will decrease the risk of oil contamination. We're going to be paying for a wildlife officer through the state police to uh, improve the access to um, state patrols upriver. We're working with the Native American tribes to provide enhanced access for their elders to native plant sites. We're doing all kinds of things to help the social. And then on the economic side, I mentioned it's a good deal for eWeb. We're also going to be having, it's a roughly about $150 million worth of construction uh, Upper Mackenzie over the course of the next eight years, which is going to help the local economy. So a couple of things that we're doing on the environmental side, fish passage I mentioned, fish protection, um, and habitat enhancements. Those all sort of go together, but let me show you the big ones. This is an aerial view of Trailbridge Reservoir. Right now you see that red line kind of in the lower left corner. That's as far as fish can get right now. Um, when the project was put in in 1958, nobody had fish ladders at that time. And so in lieu of fish passage, eWeb put in a spawning channel. And so since that time, fish have gone up to the spawning channel and, and spawned, but that's as far as they go. As part of the settlement agreement and under the new license, we expect we're going to put in a fish ladder uh, that will start just below a tail race barrier, which is that red line and allow fish to travel up and into Trailbridge Reservoir. That will provide uh, them access to about five new miles of stream habitat. Um, the fish species that we're most concerned about are spring Chinook salmon, which migrate through Portland and up over Willamette Falls and all the way up to Carmen Smith, and will now have access to the additional five miles of habitat, and native bull trout, which are a, a threatened species um, and live up there. And when we put in the project in 58, we split, we bifurcated the population of bull trout. So we have a population above and below the dam that they're now going to be able to inter intermingle and, and, uh, and get back and forth. So biologists tell me it's all good stuff. <laughs> then we're going to be adding a fish screen. Um, and the fish screen will collect both baby fish and adult <coughs> fish and send them down through a pipe back into the river so they don't have to go through the turbine. Um, they can pass safely through a Kaplan turbine, which is what we have at Trailbridge but their chance of survival is much better by using this fish screen. It's going to be very similar to the fish screen that we have on our other projects on the Mackenzie at Lieberg and Walterville. You might have seen those, except this one's going to be in the middle of a reservoir and it's going to float like a floating dock. Um, there is a much bigger version of this over uh, on the Deschutes River at the Pelton Roundby project that PGE owns. We're going to have a smaller version, but it's going to be in our reservoir and float up and down. We're also going to do a whole bunch of non-aquatic measures, um, environmental measures for, uh, well, for recreation, vegetation, wildlife, and historic and cultural resources primarily. Um, the big ticket items are the fish passage, fish ladder, and fish screen. But um, on the recreation side, we're going to rebuild the project campgrounds. We have three campgrounds up there. When we surveyed the users during the relicensing, we found that 50% of the users of those campgrounds are from the Eugene Springfield area. And so we know that uh, local citizens will use those. We're going to rebuild the existing day use areas and add a new day use area with picnicking. One of the other things we found is that people are starting to recreate more closely to home, um, probably because of economics. And, uh, and we're going to try to meet that need by adding to our facilities. We're going to add fishing and boating access and then build a visitor center because this project has been called eWeb's crown jewel, and it doesn't have any sort of visitor center uh, associated with it. People don't know that it's an eWeb facility, and so we're going to add uh, to that. So a little bit about project economics. Um, when we got into this, we thought, all right, well, we have a license. We're going we're to rebuild the project, get a new license to operate for the next 50 years. And shortly after we submitted the settlement agreement to FERC, um, the economy collapsed and power prices uh, decreased substantially to areas where they currently still remain. Um, and so we've been looking at the project. Does the project still make sense? And we compared it to, in this scenario, the relicensing, which is on the left. 
and decommissioning scenario, which is on the right. Under the decommissioning scenario, we would run the project for the next 10 years without any improvements to pay for its decommissioning. We would then remove the project and replace it with a gas-fired uh, peaking plant. And the gas plant would be sized to replace the, uh, the power generated by Carmen Smith. And so those are the two scenarios we looked at. And we did so looking at an expected carbon cost scenario. So we're assuming that there's a carbon tax. And this is the same carbon expected carbon cost that we used in eWeb's IERP that was recently completed. And what you'll see is that there is a benefit to continuing with the relicensing as proposed of a roughly uh, $263 million. And that's over the 50-year license uh, length of the license. So the project still makes sense, and uh, we plan on still going forward. And that's just a picture of the of the Carmen plant looking down towards Trowbridge Reservoir. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. <coughs> um, I'm curious about all the groups that you brought together to work on the agreement. Did they all come to agreement on their on what you? Yes. Yeah, we, um, in fact, it w I think it was somewhat unique in that we invited any party who wanted to be part of the group to come join us. And the group stayed together through the entire negotiations, and all, s all uh, 17 parties, UEB and 16 others, signed the settlement agreement at the time it was signed. So, yes, and they're still all working with us. That's great. And did you, in any time when you were talking about the dam, did you talk about the effect of uh, a, a potential climate impact on? on the production? We did. Um, we, uh, we paid, as part of the project, we paid a researcher from um, OSU to study climate impacts on the Upper Mackenzie. And uh, we needed to see, basically, the water is our fuel. And so we wanted to make sure that uh, enough <coughs> water was still going to be coming out. And his research showed that we are very lucky to be living on or near the Mackenzie River. Um, the Mackenzie River will continue to flow, should continue to flow cold for the foreseeable future. Yes, there will be some changes. We're not sure exactly what they'll look like, but um, Carmen Smith will still be um, profitable and still be a, an important part of our, uh, our utility um, under any climate scenario. Yeah. Appreciate that information. Thank yeah. you. Betty? Um, just one question. What's the cost of the visitor center? We don't know yet. We have penciled in roughly $250,000 at this point. Um, on our cost estimating for um, the recreation facilities, we, we have a large number for Trailbridge Campground, which is the, the main campground, of roughly $2.5 million to rebuild that campground completely. Um, and 250000 of that is for a visitor center. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I've got George Brown and then George Poling, then Alan. George Brown. <coughs> um, do you have, I'm just wondering, uh, this bond measure is $45 million. And it's just the first one. There'll be another one to complete the project in a few years. Um, just do you have a rough idea of? Can you give us a kind of a rough breakdown of how much is going to go for power generation, for actual physical repairs to the plant, mm -hmm. and how much is going to go for the fish ladder and the enhancement of habitat, and how much is going to go for the campgrounds? Sure. Yeah. Um, so right now, our estimate for the entire project is uh, $155 million. Of that, about $10 million is for recreation and other, say, social sort of parts of the project. There's some new homes, a new water system for the project up there. So you take the remaining $145 million and roughly split it in half. So doing the math, what, $72 uh, million roughly for um, power generation improvements and the other 72 for um, aquatic habitat improvements and fish ladder. Fish ladder, fish green are the big elements. On the power generation side, the big issue is at the, the Carmen plant, which is in the picture, the turbine runners um, have to be replaced. And so that's roughly $35 million just for the turbine runners and, tur and rewinding the generator. So that's the big chunk of it. The rest of it is uh, replacing the ancillary systems that go with power generation. So $10 million roughly for a new substation, uh, pumps, motors, controls, all that sort of stuff. This plant was built in 1960, roughly, and a lot's changed uh, in control technology since then. So we're going to be updating the plant. On the, on the aquatic side, the, the $70 million there, um, roughly, I think, $12 million for a fish ladder, roughly $40 million for a fish screen, and the rest of it, the bulk of it, is, uh, the remaining is for habitat work. <clears throat> okay. 
And then there was just a way that this was presented in our AIS that I didn't understand. So I just read a couple things and tell me what it means. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, on page uh, six, under license implementation preparation, <coughs> about halfway down that, that first paragraph, it says, um, construction manager, general contractor, to assist with the design and construction of the project, CH2M Hill recently completed the 60% de design development. And then on the next page, there's mention of um, preliminary design, 30% design for fish, um, passage work and conceptual design, 15% design for power generation facilities. What, is, uh -huh. what do those percentages mm -hmm. mean? That, that's just the percent complete. So when something is considered 100% complete in the design, then, then you can give it to your contractor to go build. Okay. In engineering terms, if you uh, conceptual design is typically thought of somewhere around 15% design, so that's a, I have a concept. And then the next thing you just do is you develop it to a preliminary design. So you have maybe the rough outline of what it's looking like and that would be 30%. Then 60% is sort of design development. You're almost close. And then the next step you would do is a 90% design, which is considered a final design, and then you do final fix-ups. So that's just telling you where we are I with see. the various pieces in, in the design stage. Well, I had an idea. It might be something like that, but mm -hmm. I wasn't sure. Thank you. Yeah. Are you through, George? I'm done. Yes, okay. thank you. Okay, so George Pollan, you're next. I may have missed it, but what is an IERP? Integrated Electric Resource Plan. Okay, all right. Energy. I figured it, I figured it was something like that. Um, in one of your slides, it, it said that you were closing some of the recreational sites, and then later on it says recreation improvements. Yep. Uh, the rebuild project campgrounds. Is it just recreational sites immediately surrounding the... Uh, the yeah. two reservoirs? Or? There, there are three project campgrounds, three campgrounds that were built as part of the original project in, in uh, early 60s. One is that, there's one at each reservoir, basically. Um, and none of them have been upgraded since. And so we are going to upgrade one of them before we start the main part of construction so that people have a nice new campground to go to. And then we're going to close Trailbridge Campground because we're going to lower the le level of Trailbridge Reservoir to do construction. Mm -hmm. And so it won't really be accessible. So we'll close that. We'll use it as a construction camp. And then once we're done with construction, we'll rebuild it completely. Right now, it doesn't have any facilities for um, RVs or motorhomes. It has limited sort of drive-in sites. Most of them are haul your stuff to a tent site kind of place. And so we're going to redo the entire campground and then reopen it um, when we're done. And so that when the public see it for the next time, it'll be completely new. So the, in the day use areas, it's going to be kind of a staggered opening and closing of all the, the facilities up there? That's correct. And is it going to be pretty well publicized, not only ahead of time, but when these closures and reopenings are going to occur? We've got some signs up already. And the I didn't mention this, but the entire project sits on national forest land. And so we're working with the National <coughs> Forest, uh, the Forest Service, and the McKenzie, Ranger, McKenzie River Ranger District to get information out to the public also. So they'll have handouts and maps. Great. Well, you know, I, I appreciate the, the, the broad spectrum of folks at the parties that you involved in the discussions on this and also the fact that this project is not just about building a new power generation plant but you're taking in you know the, the fish the, the habitat and everything else I think I think it's a great uh, a great approach to how to how to go at, at rebuilding this thank you Alan yeah I too would like to applaud your work and efforts to work with all of the different um, groups and, and to achieve consensus, that's very laudable and uh, doesn't always happen. Um, it took a while, mm -hmm. but uh, I think it's worth it in the end. And I'm happy to see all of the all of the different groups signing on to the uh, agreement. And uh, I think it's a worthy agreement. Um, most of my questions were already asked. I have uh, a couple of other ones. So the fish ladder that goes, mm -hmm. the fish screens and fish ladder that goes in. How, what's the percentage that it increases the survival of the fish? Um, we don't really know. What what we know, and, and first of all, I'm a chemical engineer and I'm not a <laughs> biologist at all, so I trust my biologist to tell me. <laughs> but um, what the biologists say is um, for Chinook salmon, right now they have access to the spawning channel that I mentioned that was originally built. And, and we've seen numbers of fish in the spawning channel since the early 60s fluctuate between roughly 100 fish down to a low of six fish a couple of times. And lately, it's been around 100 to 120. So it's, it's pretty good. They think our population up there is going to double by the opening of the fish ladder. It's just 
the habitat is, you know, to me it's like five miles of habitat. Is it really that good? And it is. And it, it's good, high-quality habitat. It's in the Upper Mackenzie. It's really clear, uh, very clear, very cold water. <laughs> and, uh, and they'll do really well. So we think the, the Chinook salmon are going to really thrive. With the bull trout, they'll be able to go up and down the ladder. And um, that population, the Mackenzie River bull trout, is supposedly one of the best bull trout populations any place. And ODFW is using fish from the Mackenzie to restock the middle fork um, <coughs> with bull trout, is my understanding. And this will just enhance the, uh, the recovery of that fish. So everything I've heard is that it's, it's really good stuff for the fish. The meat long lost relatives. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, the mayor asked my question about the water levels. Can you give a little bit more detail about that? And what was the carbon tax rate in dollars per metric ton that you were using? Mm, I'm going to have to ask for help on that one. Um, <laughs> They're behind you. <laughs> <laughs> what was the carbon tax? The carbon tax. Hold on a sec. Oops, sir. Okay. Okay. The expected carbon tax that we included in the financial analysis uh, started in about five years and started with about $2 uh, on a metric ton and then increased over the next additional five years up to about $10. It starts low and increases yeah, slowly. Slow. It may present itself in form of a carbon tax or cap and trade mm -hmm. or any other method. Right. The cap and trade systems in California are expected to start in that ten to fifteen dollar range in 2013, which is uh, substantially more than what you guys are doing. So that just makes this project that much better because it is a carbon-free resource that we're that's correct be having to uh, to keep to maintain for the next 50 years. And I, I'm, I apologize. What was your question about the water levels? Uh, um, so, what was the, what were the, some of the details around? Mm -hmm the shifts that occur and the amount of water oh, yeah, that yeah. occurs on sure. the Mackenzie because of climate change. Yeah. I know we get a shift because of the runoff. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the way that it's been explained to us is the Mackenzie River is sort of the dividing line. When the when the Mackenzie River goes by Beltnap Springs and starts aligning north-south, so from Clear Lake down to Beltnap Springs, on the, on the east side of that is sort of high cascades, very porous lava. Mm -hmm. The west of it is weathered old, old cascades and sort of surface dominated. On the, the east side is subsurface dominated, spring fed, spring dominated, and it doesn't really matter at that point whether the, the precipitation falls as rain or snow, it seems like. It goes into this lava sponge that we call it, and then it gets split out at these great springs, Great Spring and, and uh, um, Clear Lake, uh, at Tamlidge Falls, at some other <laughs> sites along, uh, along the river there. So, what he found is that the snow line will go up. So we will have more precipitation that falls as rain rather than snow. It will still go into the lava sponge. The timing of the, of the rain may be um, more shifted towards uh, into the winter, so um, drier springs. But the overall volume of precipitation that falls, he didn't think was going to change all that much. It's all a bit speculation, you know, but sure. overall he felt like the overall precipitation in, um, uh, in the upper Mackenzie Valley wasn't going to change all that much. Um, and because the way the system runs with springs, that it's, it's the head, it's the pressure in the lava that pushes the water out through the springs. So as long as we get as much enough precipitation, it's going to maintain the pressure and the amount of water coming out of the springs should be fairly constant. So it seemed like we were going to be okay. One of the, the places where it's going to impact us is um, the snow melt, which we get a lot of water from snow melt um, when the snow high cascades does melt. That timing is going to shift. So typically now we get too much water. We call it too much water. We spill water at Carmen Diversion from mid-May to mid-June. That may shift a month earlier. Um, and so if you're running the Mackenzie River on your in your raft, you'd probably, instead of waiting, you know, right now it gets to be August and it gets to be too too dry, too bony. It's probably going to be in July when that happens. So, anyway. Thanks. Yeah. Mike? And then Thank you, Mayor. I was uh, almost, uh, well, I think it was a year ago, almost almost this exact time when I had the chance to tour oh, yeah, Smith right. last year. And uh, it was an amazing opportunity to really learn about the facility that's I learned a great deal about how important it is to the community as well. So I, I'm happy to see this project going ahead as it is, and I'm happy to support it. I, mm -hmm. it, it was really impressive, the tour down there. <clears throat> what, what's one of the most amazing things to me is these gigantic 
uh, turbine cores that were put up there in the late 50s or the, you know, I mean, and, and the high elevation that that is and the level of, of mechanical sophistication that was required to get those, get them straight up and down, get them to spin right. Everything involved in all the engineering really had to be pretty amazing. So. Yeah. It's a wonderful facility. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I have nothing much to say beyond to reiterate the compliments you've already received. Uh, very, very, very good presentation. I uh, happened to spend the weekend up there this this last weekend. Um, it was mainly the Saheli Falls mm -hmm. loop, uh, which is a, just a. If you've not been there, man, that is tremendous. It's uh, hard to believe that that is so close to our home. But uh, I had a chance to talk to a couple of people about the project and about the. Uh, uh, relicensing and and the improvements that are being made and uh, and universally it's uh, not just accepted it's lauded uh, by fishermen by conservationists by pretty much everybody that I spoke to about it it's uh, pretty amazingly um, d uh, devised and followed through on and uh, the, the I guess the one compliment that I'd like to add is that uh, no matter what questions you were asked today you had the answer or the answer was immediately sitting right behind you to, to okay. much greater detail than anyone could even hope for so um, it's very impressive just uh, the entire job and I, I expect that uh, uh, the combination of the project will all be able to stand back for the next 50 years and enjoy your work uh, the the only thing I would like to state is that uh, the Saheli Falls Loop is up, up above the Carmen Reservoir, and uh, and I suspect that that's not even going to be even slightly affected by any of the project or the engineering or the uh, the construction. Yeah, that's that's correct. But um, you probably walked over our new bridge. So I did. Yeah, so yeah. that's actually part of our project. So we did complete <laughs> that bridge. Um, we are going to right on the west side of the bridge. We're going to be adding a new day use area, mm -hmm. and and so that is part of it. But it it's not part of the big the big construction. That's right in the big broad gravel yeah. expanse there. Yeah. Yeah, people have been using it as a day use area for years, and so we thought, let's give them some facilities. Yeah, it's, it's kind of all gravelly now. So I've, you're going to add a little bit of landscaping <laughs> in there. Landscaping, some picnic tables, other things like that. Uh, yeah. This is a wonderful environment, nice setting, and the uh, uh, two. Confirm the fact that you what, what you said the Mackenzie River is clear and it is cold. <laughs> Chris, thank you. Um, I just add my voice to everything that's been said. I really appreciate the presentation. I think it's very thorough, very complete. Um, Councilor Ortiz and I had the opportunity to get a Forest Service tour oh, of that <coughs> area up there um, a few years back, and um, they took us to the Mackenzie Bridge Ranger Station where they have that huge tabletop diorama. And it was very helpful because they could point out the geological features in that area, and they talked a lot about the absorbency of the volcanic area in there, which is why you don't have a lot of streams and trail or streams and creeks up there. Um, but that really confirms what they were saying in terms of the water going through that porous rock and then coming out. And, uh, and I thought that was very interesting. Uh, the other thing I'd mention is I was just um, reading a story not too long ago about. Um, they're beginning to determine why fish suffer fatalities going through turbines. Mm -hmm. um, the new information shows that their pressure changes are uh, influencing the swim bladders. Ah. And so they're designing new turbine systems uh, to, it's not the rough passage, it's the air pressure change. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering the degree to which that will be accommodated in the, um, the design right. of the facility. Well, so what we're hoping to do with, with the fish screen, we should be able to screen out all fish, so no fish will go through. So the no turbines. fish will go through. Yep. Okay. We, it's it's called a 100% exclusion screen, so it is literally the screen is like uh, well, it's a little bit bigger, bigger than your screen door. But essentially, all water going through the turbine has to pass through the screen, and all fish are excluded. So, so we should have no it. fish. Yep. Great, thank Pre you. The pressure's mm -hmm. off. Pressure's off. Yeah, it's great exclusion <laughs> zone. No. <laughs> so, what did the fish say when he hit the dam? Ouch! Damn. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're so how water. many? <laughs> <laughs> how many? Uh, <laughs> fish with no eyes. How many um, <laughs> campsites are there now, and how many will be? Um, at Ice Cap Creek Campground, which is the uppermost one by Carmen Diversion Reservoir, there's something like 22, and it's going to remain small. So that it probably be about the same number. The other one. Is, the next one is uh, it's called Lakes End Campground, and it's at the head end of Smith Reservoir. Yeah. It is a boat-in only campground. It is a sweet spot to go. Really cool. Um, it's very rustic. It's going to remain very rustic, and probably about 20 sites also there. The the big facility, uh, Trailbridge Campground. The original design had similar number. I think it was a little bit higher, maybe in the upper 20s. And those rarely get used because what's happened is the RVs have taken over the day use area. So we're going to separate 
the day use area from the camping area, create some RV spots. I can't tell you how many we're going to wind up with, but the idea is probably somewhere in the 20s. So a total for 60. So. Um, I I'm going to wrap this up and thank you again. It was a great presentation. Yeah, and great. just say, as I was listening to you say that you checked to see how many people were from our area and that you were serving people from our area, but I would uh, look at Georgia and say we're interested in serving people from other areas too. This is what you're doing is going to serve our tourism industry too. So I think it, it works in, in both ways and is important to us in both ways. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, Tell your joke. No, no, that was better than his joke. It was his joke. Move on thing. to the second <laughs> work <laughs> session, which is the Jefferson Acres Road Improvement Project. Uh, the, uh, we keep going in the way that we've been going in the past, past few weeks. This must be the uh, the polling project. So. <laughs> <laughs> Away whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you. We're ready for you. We're ready. Okay, good. <laughs> good evening, Mayor Piercy and members of the council. Um, I'm going to talk about the Jefferson Acres Road Improvement Project. And uh, before I start, I'd like to recognize um, Patrick Cox, our project manager, is here tonight, and Lindsay Seltzer from Transportation Planning, and also Eric Jones from Public Affairs. They've all been instrumental in the public process to date on this project. Um, I'm going to give you an outline of what I wanted to talk about tonight. I'll give you a little of the project history through the capital improvement program, some of the recent uh, assessment project history, uh, the public process that uh, we've gone through on this particular project, a design report which is uh, prescribed by the Eugene Code, uh, a design exception that requires uh, council action, um, remonstrances, which is a little bit pre premature, but I think is important. Premature in that we usually talk about those at the formation of a local improvement district, which if we proceed is about a year away, but it's an important issue. Um, and then the options available to the council, again, those are prescribed by code, and then the city manager recommendation. So the history of the project, it's uh, one of the projects identified in, in TransPlan as a uh, improvement of a neighborhood collector to urban standards. It's been in for capital improvement programs, and it's uh, most recently in the capital improvement program for 2012-2017. And at that point, there's a lot of interest by the council and by the citizens to move that project forward because it had been in the capital improvement program for numerous years and it had always kind of been right outside the, the two-year funding window of the capital improvement program. So in 2000, and the program that was uh, adopted for 2012 and to 17, it moved forward and then was adopted, uh, funded in the fiscal year 12 annual budget. Uh, some of our recent assessment projects um, that, that uh, almost all of you are familiar with are Crest Friendly and Story. We had design exceptions with that project in that we only had a sidewalk on one side of the street. We had over 50% of the property owners remonstrate against that project, which required six members of the council to um, direct us to, to or approve that project going forward. And assessments for single family homes ranged from $1,100 to $13,200. And the, those on the low end were those properties that received a low income subsidy. Uh, Maple Elmira, we had design exceptions in that the sidewalks were curbside rather than setback. We didn't have uh, more than 50% remonstrance and the assessments ranged from 900 to 12,000 again for single family homes in the lower end were were those that received a 5-6 subsidy. And then finally Old Coburg Road was uh, less than 50% remonstrance and there's only a couple of single family <coughs> homes. Most of it was uh, uh, zoned other than residential and assessments from 1,500 to 12,600 again for the low income subsidies. And so those were all um, constructed in the summer of 2009 with assessments being made in 2010. And then subsequent to that, um, that last project being assessed, which was the Crest Project, the Council formed a subcommittee that worked in 2009 and 2010. And the charge of that subcommittee was to review the existing code on assessments and the inequities in the code identified by the City Council and develop recommended changes in the code for consideration by the Council. So those uh, recommendations came back to the City Council in September of 2010 and then 
in December of that year, an ordinance was adopted that amended the code, and uh, it had an effective date per the city charter six months later of June 2011. And the Jefferson Acres Road Improvement Project is the first project, the first assessment project under that new code. So the public process we've used to date uh, with this project uh, has been a series of meetings and a, and a neighborhood walkabout. So the first meeting was really to talk about the goals and objectives, uh, and it was uh, in January of this year, of the public process, and then uh, inform the residents of the kind of the life history of a street improvement project from being identified in transplant, working its way into the six-year CIP and then the capital budget through design and construction and and finally the levying of assessments. I also talk about uh, the functional classification of the street as a neighborhood collector and and then finally talk about some of the uh, design components both for uh, things like sidewalks in the street as well as traffic calming. Uh, the walkabout that was held in in February is really a way for staff in the neighborhood to see uh, conditions on the ground and to learn of particular concerns or problems uh, that people uh, view with the street and to, and what their values are about that street and, and their neighborhood. Uh, the second meeting in March was really to talk about the assessment process, how that works, uh, how assessments can be financed through the city, low income subsidy, that sort of thing. And then also um, four different design options that, um, that based upon um, the, the design standards for for uh, neighborhood collector streets. And then our final meeting a week ago was really to talk about um, the design report that's prescribed by the, the city code and what was going to be presented tonight. And also what we believed was the, the option, the design option that best met uh, what we had heard in the previous uh, public meetings and the walkabout. And so then if uh, we're certainly not done with the design, so if the, if we, if the direction tonight is to con continue, we'll work with, uh, continue to work with the residents along that street on traffic calming, which is an important aspect of the project, and parking. We haven't re really resolved the, the amount and type of parking on the street, and then, uh, and then more discussion about the sidewalks. So uh, one of the items that's required in the design report is a map that shows the properties that would be included in a local improvement district. So that's the, the bold line on both sides of Jefferson Acres Road between Gillum on the left and just shy of Providence on the right. And uh, that, that length of uh, Jefferson is 1,700 feet. The right of way width is, uh, varies between 50 and 60 feet. There are uh, 48 properties within that boundary. Nine of those properties, when they developed, uh, the owner signed an irrevocable petition that basically says, uh, rather than doing any improvements at the time of development, uh, they sign a document that says, I agree to participate in a future local improvement district for those improvements. Um, three properties have paid prepaid equivalent assessments, so they've paid for what at the time we thought was going to be the cost to improve the street. So they developed and paid that prepaid equivalent assessment. Um, and so if the project goes forward, they wouldn't, we would use those funds to pay their share and, not, uh, and they wouldn't be assessed. Uh, the zoning is residential for the, the zoning and the use is the same for all of the properties. And again, the, uh, the functional classification is a neighborhood collector. <coughs> the existent the existing pavements about 20 feet wide and there's uh, street lights and within your uh, council packet is a list of all of the <laughs> accessible properties and their owners and that's another Mark, another for the benefit of the audience would you I know you've said this many times but okay. it seems like we need to tell people what, uh, what, what a collector is and how that's different than other okay. kinds of streets well the the functional classifications goes from local street to neighborhood collector major collector um, minor arterial and arterial, and the and the and the objective is a, of a neighborhood collector is to essentially collect the traffic from the neighborhood and bring it out to the streets of higher functional classification. So in this case, it would be the traffic on Jefferson Acres would would uh, move out to Gillum Road or down to uh, Coburg Road to the east, and and Coburg. Um, 
it must be, a, I'm not positive, it must be a minor arterial or a major arterial. And, and uh, Gillum must be a major collector. Thank you. Okay. So the, the concept di design that we came up with was um, two travel lanes, uh, each 10 feet wide, um, traffic calming, which again is something that we still need to work with the neighborhood on what that looks like and with uh, internal uh, stakeholders such as the fire department. Um, two, two five foot sidewalks, one on each side of the street, set back. Um, rain gardens, which is the, that little green strip on the right uh, to treat storm water. Um, street trees and parking bays. So rather than having a strip of parking from one end to the other, it would have bays that would be cut in similar to on uh, Broadway, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that we still, we still need to work more with the, the neighborhood to get a, a better sense of, of how much and where the parking would be. Uh, another aspect of the design re report is that's required by the code is the estimated cost. So at this point, the, the total project cost is estimated at 1.27 million. 770,000 of that would be assessable, um, and 500,000 would be <coughs> city cost, and the estimated assessments are around $16,000. And that's before any low income subsidy. So, uh, properties that qualify for a low income subsidy, if they're single family, owner occupied, uh, residential properties, they could, they could, um, receive anywhere from a one-third to a five-six subsidy of the assessment. The so 60,000 is the average? Well, um, if you recall, the one of the changes in the assessment code was to as establish an equivalent assessment union for residential properties. So all 48 th of those properties would pay the same, would pay 48,000. Excuse me, 16,000. And then the low income subsidy would be applied to that for those that qualified. So the design standards that we have for uh, neighborhood collectors uh, call out for setback sidewalks on both sides of the street. <coughs> and the design exceptions that we have um, available to us are focused on all of them, all six of them are focused on, um, on um, objective technical criteria such as is there sufficient right of way, are there wetlands, is the topography um, such that uh, sidewalks wouldn't be uh, workable on one or both sides of the street. There's a seventh exception that is more policy based and it's if we've gonna, done a public process and there's uh, not support for a particular design then the council can uh, make a design exception provided that the city engineer determines that it's both safe and functional. And that if you recall, that's the, that exception was created when we did the River Avenue project um, years ago and we ended up uh, working a second time with the property owners to, uh, to do some exceptions that met their needs that didn't quite meet the needs of the, our design standards. Um, so again, remonstrances are typically submitted and considered by a hearings official at the time of the public hearing before a look, uh, uh, a council resolution on to form a local improvement district. So we're we're a year away from that point in time. But there's um, a lot of interest in this project, and as you can see from this slide, a lot of um, objections. So I, I in your handout, I, um, I updated that I think from 26 to 27. So we have out of 48 properties, there are 27 valid remonstrances, which means that the project. If we, if we go forward and come back to you a year from now to form a local improvement district, it will take six affirmative votes from the city council um, to move that project forward. We also have letters of objection from four people that have signed irrevocable petitions in the past and from three renters. So there's um, uh, su uh, sufficient or substantial objections to the project. And, and and a lot of it has to do with the cost of the individual assessments and, uh, and then also some issues on the design in particular about uh, si having sidewalks on, on both sides of the street. <coughs> uh, 
Um, so the council options, and again, these are prescribed by code, are, are either to direct us to complete the design and call for bids, modify the improvements, and direct us to complete the project and call for bids, uh, request additional information, <coughs> excuse me, or decide not to make the improvement. And so the, the recommendation is really using that design exception criteria is to direct us to modify the improvement to remove the setback sidewalk on the north side and then move forward with the project uh, for preparing plans and specifications and calling for bids. And, and prior to doing that, we would continue to work with the neighborhood associate or the, the residents on the street, those that would be assessed, <coughs> to sort out the issues around the, the amount and type of parking, uh, the location of, this, uh, of the sidewalk in, in relation to parking bays that may be desired, and then uh, uh, the traffic calming element of it and what that might be. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll stop and entertain any questions. Hi, um, George, I've got you in the queue. Um, I know it's characteristic, actually, that w once people see uh, assessments, they um, aren't happy to see them. So I, I, I know that generally happens. My, my biggest concern, honestly, is that we learn from the experiences we've had before and that um, um, I know each project is different, and so I'm doing sort of apples and oranges in a way. But I just want to be sure when we think this one through that we kind of have a picture in our minds of what the real result is going to be so that when, when it's done we don't say, that doesn't really work out the way we thought it was going to work out and it feels dangerous or something of that sort. So I just want to be sure we really are um, careful about what it is we, uh, we end up with when <coughs> we get it all done, whether it's pleasing to everybody or mm -hmm. or not that's about as um, carefully as I can <laughs> say that but I, I think we all know what I mean by that I'm just very concerned that we don't um, you know it's always kind of a struggle to get through trying to please everybody to come up with the very best project that you can to do the very best job you can and but in the end we, you want to do something that not that just w serves everybody the the best and and that you will want to live with for generations <coughs> to come so it's, it's, it's like we need to be really learning from what came before George Poli and then Mike okay uh, as some of you uh, probably received the emails some of the emails that I forwarded on to you from the over the last week or so uh, I received about a dozen of them from people living on Jefferson Acres um, from different households, uh, two of them, um, I don't know if they were the renters or not because they, they didn't show up on the list of property owners, so those I couldn't tell, but all these folks were opposed to this project. Some of them were just adamantly opposed, some were opposed, but if it were to go through at least, let's look at some modifications such as the sidewalk on one side. Uh, I think parking bays or cutouts were, were mentioned and also some sort of traffic calming, whether they be speed bumps or, or whatever. So, uh, you know, I responded to some of them, but then they just started coming in one after the other, so I, I didn't uh, respond any further. When I first came on the council in 2003, this was one of the first things that was brought to my attention by somebody that was paying attention actually to the transplant, said, why does this keep getting bumped back? So I, I took the charge to kind of keep it up at the front of the list, and now that it's there, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in a situation where I'm... Careful what you wish for. Yeah. <laughs> but what, I, what I've been telling people is that if a majority of the folks don't want this project to go through, I am going to support their will and, and uh, suggest that we don't go forward with this. And to me, right now, we've got 27 valid remonstrances. That's, uh, as Mike pointed out, that's almost 60% right now. <coughs> and I would hate to see us actually move any farther with this project and spend time and money on it if we come down at the end of the, the, the year or whatever it is and we've spent all this money and we still have that same number. So um, <coughs> I'm real uncomfortable with moving it forward, but um, you know that's my opinion. That's what I'm, I'm doing based on what I'm hearing from the people in the neighborhood. I'm all, all for improving the conditions of our unimproved streets. 
However, uh, I'm afraid that this is going to turn this part of Jefferson Acres Road, which is a nice community or a nice little neighborhood, <laughs> into another Arcadia or another Minda Drive, where you're going to have people using it not as a collector, but as a, as a pass-through to get from Gillum to Coburg Road. Arcadia, it's, it's Harlow to, to, to Willa Kenzie. Minda, it's, it's, it's uh, Gillum to North Kenzie. North Kenzie. Uh, I can't support moving this project forward based on what I'm hearing from the people at this point. Hey, and I've got Mike and then Alan. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brown. Mayor. I, uh, it's interesting. Um, Gillum, as it runs north and south, is the dividing line between four and five. And so Jefferson Acres, as it runs east and west, is in four. But if you stand on the corner of Gillum and Jefferson Acres, you can see my house. So this is really close to my neighborhood. Okay. Um, I have asked for a, a number of times, and I know that the staff's been working on this for quite a while now, for us to have a more comprehensive plan for our our, uh, our roads that don't that aren't up to a, a city standard for our un why is the word escaping me now uh, uh, unimproved uh, road network because for a long time we did you know for for the reasons that we did we would bring uh, county roads into the city limits and for good reason and at the time for a good cause and you know for for various list of reasons we did that I'd like to see us not only have a, a comprehensive sort of plan for how we're going to deal with the unimproved street network we have, but uh, maybe a, some some policy discussion around how we deal with bringing in roads that aren't up to an urban standard when, they, when we bring them in in the first place, or at least some plan to get them there so that we don't have this reoccurring problem over time. Um, but to kind of, uh, you know, in a, <coughs> I know this has been on transplant for a very large number of years, but to deal with it... Um, in an isolated circumstance from all the other unimproved streets in town, rather than to have a more uh, 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 a more homogenized plan for how we're going to deal with all of them, I think is is not is not fair to the folks that live there either. So, I'm not sure I can support it either, especially with the large number of, of remonstrances that have already been received. I've got a history of trying to listen to that and uh, voted once, as I recall, on something a lot like that. When the folks say they don't want it, I can't see forcing it on so Alan so um, the normal design standard for this type of street a neighborhood collector is to have setback sidewalks on both sides that's correct so why yeah. was this design exception changed to lower the cost or for other reasons well and that's a good question I and I intended to cover that so um, it's similar to Elmira where we um, instead of removing one of the sidewalks we made them curbside is that both roads were developed um, with relatively wide rights of way 50 to 60 feet but people built their homes close to the edge of the right of way because the pavement was only 20 feet wide so the the impact of having um, a new street same with 20 20 feet but then setback sidewalks is it really encroaches into into um, into or it places the sidewalk and pedestrians closer to their front door. So it, it, it negatively impacts the, kind of the character of their homes in that street. And so that's, the, that's the, the re really the reason behind proposing a, a design exception is to balance that need for pedestrians with the need to try to maintain the character of the, the homes along that street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... Um, Okay. So the remonstrances, um, 27 of them so far. Can you characterize them <coughs> as George kind of tried to characterize them, but some of them are no under any circumstances and some are yes under certain circumstances. And secondly, the four irrevocable petitions, mm -hmm. you said that they paid prepaid a development fee? You know, there's um, all told there are, are are nine properties with irrevocable petitions, uh, three additional properties that don't have irrevocable petitions but have already prepaid, and um, and then there's uh, 27 properties that have submitted letters of objection. So 
I would characterize it as some of those are opposed to um, the project regardless, and um, and I wouldn't be as optimistic as you. I would say some of them are um, uh, aren't as po aren't as a, as <coughs> opposed as vehemently as the others. But still opposed. Uh, still opposed. So if they had a I don't know that. No, right. I don't know that. I don't think we'll be a year from, if we go forward. I don't think we'll be a year from now with less remonstrances. Some people may change their mind, but others, others of that 48 that don't have irrevocable petitions may submit a letter of objection. So I think a year from now you'll be faced with the decision of whether there's six votes to move forward. And the three that prepaid, what if we don't move forward, what happens to that, to them? Do they well, get a refund or? No, 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 to me as long as the, as long as we continue to carry <coughs> the project in our transportation system plan, transplan, then it's still a, a viable project um, at, some point. at some point in the future. So why would we keep it in the trans plan if we reject it at this point? Well, because uh, as, change in well, as, as Councillor Clark or? proposed, there may we may be funding street improvements in a different way. It doesn't so the formula would change and, the, right. and it'd still be in the queue, right? I don't see that happening. We can't even deal with our existing streets, much less our unimproved streets. <laughs> but um, okay. Thanks. George Brown and then Chris. Thank you, Mayor. I'd just like to go back to the idea of just putting in one sidewalk again. You, you kind of explained the rationale, but is there a, a, a was this at, at a um, suggestion of, of some of the property owners? Or yes. Yes. And, yeah, and some of the input during the public process that we heard from, from many more or many property owners <coughs> and and I guess the second part of that question is why uh, do we remove it on the north side but not the why would you pick the south side to the well again that was part of the the public input and also because there, there's an access to Sheldon High School on the south side of the street uh -huh. so there's one lot that's owned by the school district I, I and it yeah, provides access to Sheldon so so People wouldn't be crossing mid-block to get to that access. Okay, and you know it's been a while since I've been on that road, um, and so I, I don't know what the conditions like. I, I think back to Cress Story Friendly. The neighbors wanted the roads repaired. They weren't happy with the assessments, or and then some of them not so happy with the ultimate design, the way it played out. But they wanted them repaired. Of course, some of them were really hilly, and they were actually getting getting dangerous you know on a rainy stormy day it was kind of tricky to negotiate some of those curves on the yeah, uh, on the steep hill shot. so so this is I would say there shot. most of the neighbors did want them repaired yeah. a lot of them didn't straight. want to pay for it but they mm -hmm. wanted them repaired how bad it what is the condition of the street is it approaching um, you know like it was I say on Crest Drive before that was repaired um, in in terms of the pavement com condition um, Probably, but it didn't. It, uh, Crest had a lot of other issues in terms of sight distance and in oh. curves, whereas this is a fairly flat, straight, straight uh, stretch of road. So it's not as it's not as dangerous uh, due to the condition of the pavement as the Crest roads were. Okay. <coughs> yeah, it's kind of difficult to. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it probably needs to be to be repaired, but if a, if a lot of the residents don't want to for it. I don't know. It's kind of, it's kind of a tough one here. Thank you. Chris. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is, a, this is a very interesting one. And um, what I'm trying to balance is uh, kind of the community's interest <coughs> versus the local neighborhood interest. I think those are really the, the competing elements here. And the question's kind of been asked is, if we don't do anything, what happens to this street? Mm -hmm. In the course of the next five years, if we don't do it, what happens to this street? It doesn't change, but I mean, talk about the right. condition of the street. Right. Well, it'll it'll continue to deteriorate. Um, I mean, but it but it's also in that group of 50 miles of unimproved, unimproved streets, streets that continue to deteriorate over time. Right. 
Right. Um, but nothing that would be, I, and I'm hesitant to use the word, you know, like catastrophic or major. It would just be the continued deterioration of the street over that period of time. That's correct. Um, what's very <coughs> persuasive to me are the number of remonstrance letters that have been sent in. While they don't technically um, represent remonstrances, they, bas they basically indicate what will happen, what will most likely happen. I don't expect necessarily any of these to fall off. So for me, if this were a major collector or something where the community's interest was at stake, the community uses this regularly, it's a street that's used by more than these neighbors, it has an arterial element to it, um, I might be more inclined to be willing to support continuing on with the project. But to me, it looks like a neighborhood street. <clears throat> and it's serving these neighbors and really not much of anyone else. Um, and so if you've got more than half the neighbors on this street saying, I don't want this project, I got to say, I'm inclined to, to say, okay, I'm, I'm willing to, to go along with that. Um, if at some point in the future they decide they want to have the project, it's taking into account that at some later date it's going to be a more expensive project, but at least it will be on their terms and not forced on them. That's when you would have those other three folks would be able to get their, um, you know, money into the, into the construction. So I'm not necessarily inclined to support it at this point simply because I don't see this as having that great an impact on the community as a whole. Can I just uh, add a clarification? We would consider these remonstrances, so we wouldn't ask people to say no a second time. So we would carry, if, if we move forward, we would carry these 27. Which would be the ones that would right. go forward. Right. Then, then that makes my case even more, so I appreciate that. Yeah. George Bowling. Well, actually, this part of Jefferson Acres not only serves that one little stretch of neighborhood, but it also serves Sheldon High School, because there's a lot of parents that will use that to drop their kids off and do the cut through the, the back property and and kind of an answer to the question of what happens to the money you know Arcadia was the first uh, upgrade in, or improve of an unimproved street that I dealt with when I first came on the council it's been three times now that's come up for discussion and three times it's been voted down so it still stays in the transplant and it, and it comes up uh, again it's just unfortunate that we have to spend as much time, effort, and money to get to a point where we can say yes or no on a project. I just wish there was some <coughs> quicker way to do it. I appreciate all the work that, that Public Works has done on this. Uh, you know, like I said, this was in response to the transplant and also a response to a couple of the, the people living on that street asking to, you know, let's move this project forward. Um, but in the long run, like I said, I have to respect the will of the majority of the property owners, and that's that's what's going to, you know, decide the way I vote on it. Betty, um, how much would the assessments go down if you eliminate one of the sidewalks? Um, we did, uh, did it doing just a rough estimate, probably uh, nine hundred dollars of property, so they go down from sixteen thousand to 15, a little over fifteen thousand. Why is this more than the uh, crest assessments were? Well, uh, a couple of reasons. One, it's we're later uh, in time, and and we've we've missed that uh, <coughs> sweet spot in the recession where construction prices were so good. If that's uh, <laughs> hard to believe that. Um, and and the other is um, uh, on the on the crest project. If you recall, we had because of the uh, economy, we had the money that we budgeted for the project ended up being substantially more than the bid prices that came in. So we, the council chose to use that difference to buy down the assessments on all three, the Crest, um, Maple Elmira, and Chad Drive. So those, those don't reflect what the assessments would have been. The, the slide didn't reflect what they would have been without that additional buy-down approved by the council. Another question, uh, do these people know that uh, they can delay paying until the property changes hands? Yes, one of the, one of the public meetings was um, about <coughs> assessments and financing of assessments <coughs> and, and the changes in the code that the council had approved. Okay, well, I, th I think we improved it, but I, I do think that really the whole city should pay for streets anywhere, but that's, we're a long ways from that. I think um, so. How about if you how about if you eliminated both sidewalks? Yeah, 
the same street horn. Well, um, n having not done any uh, design of that, but it's not going to it's not going to be a significant uh, change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So here we are. Um, uh, my sense around the table is we don't have enough um, votes to move forward, so I don't see a point in putting it out there unless you want to, George. What I would suggest, though, is uh, you do have a different option <coughs> for a motion that I would suggest then, right? There's an right, four. option for, oh. because it would, be, it would be helpful for us to have that and then have we, something. yeah, because then we won't spend additional dollars doing it, which is, we do appreciate that, so. I think option four was. Uh, yeah, oh, okay. Decide not to make the improvement. Yeah. So you need a motion to that. Yeah. yeah, if that's what your will is, then I would suggest that be done. Decide not to make the improvement. Yeah. Right. So I would suggest that as a motion. The only uh, comment I would make is at, when you get around to talking about what um, Mike has been asking and requesting that we talk about what to do with these unimproved streets. And I bear in mind what Alan was talking about, about the resources that we don't have. There may be a way that we want to approach these unimproved streets that is a very different level than we do mm -hmm. now and that may end up being a way for us to at least do something so but I, I think that needs to be done not in the context of one street but in the context of all streets so the we city. treat it My fairly but city. I do think we need to be thinking um, out of the box on this so we can make up some headway to keep some of these these streets uh, in decent um, usable condition mm -hmm. if not up to any city standard that we would like to have. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, you want to put the motion on the table? Um, it's option number four. Mm -hmm. Okay, I move to um, not make the improvement. That's the Acres Road. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, please indicate. Not make the improvement. Mm -hmm. One. Oh, you I'm want sorry, to All right, question. That doesn't take it off the, the, oh, off the transfer. No. no. Okay. Yeah. All right, we ready to vote on that? Well, shouldn't it say We're at not to make the improvement at this time? At this time. At, at this, this time? time? At this time. Okay. So we're adding those three words to this, at this time? At this time. Right, I think what that would mean is we would not do any more work to set up no. a right. LRD. Right. But it will right. stay in transplant someday in some right. major. Or something. The cloud. A miracle happened and the city won the lottery. We could change that. <laughs> Back to asking the question about the, at this time. <laughs> All those in favor, please indicate. It's seven in favor and none in opposition. It passes. Thank you all very much. And we have a few moments left. Are you desirous of doing the um, consent calendar this time? That's all we have. Right? We have the public forum. The public and public so and the Pledge of Allegiance. And the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm happy with the consent now. Happy with doing the consent now. Okay. George, are you consent. happy to do it now? I'm um, sure. <laughs> on the table. I move to approve the consent calendar. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion? None. All those in favor, please indicate. I, oh, oh. Seven in favor and none in opposition. Actually. Oh. Sorry. I wanted to say. <laughs> I wanted to pull B. I told you well, somebody was going to pull B. I wanted to pull B. Sorry. Okay. Have to go back and do something to undo the, the vote. Would you like to discuss something instead of just uh, just pull it. You could so make a comment if you just wanted to make a comment. Again. Okay, so we're going to pull D, <coughs> and uh, we're voting on the rest of it. I'm call all those in favor, please indicate. Seven in favor and none in opposition. It passes. Thank you. <coughs> and. Um, George Cole, would you be able to pledge this evening? Yes, ma'am. So, Mayor, now you need to talk oh, about no, D. D. You need to do D, D. D. before that. Are we going to do, do D now, or are we going to do D at, at We're the doing top? the consent agenda right now. Yeah. So. Yeah, okay. okay. All right. Are you okay? Yeah. I didn't know if you wanted it to do it before the whole... She's um, so, the, the question I have is how this proceeds forward. Um, we really haven't had a, a, much of a conversation about the content of, the, of, of this particular ordinance, which doesn't have anything <coughs> to do with content. Um, and, and in particular, one of the things that I wanted to discuss was the um, size of the sign uh, 
be, shall not exceed 12 square feet, which is basically four by three. And um, when, I wanted to have a conversation about that, whether that was the right size. Two of those and each property was the right size or maybe something smaller, which would be more what I was thinking, of, maybe um, three by three or something like that. So that would be nine square feet. Um, how does this process move forward and when do we have that conversation? So if you vote on this tonight, then a public hearing will happen before the Planning Commission. You will then get a recommendation from the Planning Commission. Um, the intent would then be to have a public hearing before the City Council um, and then following the public hearing, um, depending on uh, what your preference is, either schedule a work session with you after the public hearing or schedule it for action and have the conversation there but there will be several opportunities for the steps. public to weigh in and for the council to <coughs> have the conversation. So how would we have the, the conversation be around that particular item? How would we interject that into this so that we would have a cons cons conversation within the public hearing at both and at the planning commission and along the way that we talk about, say, 9 versus 12 square feet? Well, the public can certainly um, talk about that issue when they see the proposal. <coughs> if one of the things that you would like is to specifically call out that um, when the AIS is prepared for the Planning Commission, that can certainly be one of the things that staff uh, particularly identifies for both the public hearing before the Planning Commission um, and then the Planning Commission recommendation is, you know, the Council hasn't decided that 12 square feet is the right square footage so public please weigh in on that uh, planning commission please provide the council um, a particular recommendation on the square footage um, if you would like we could also schedule a work session following the planning commission recommendation before your public hearing um, in case you want to have that conversation and then say you know what we really want the public hearing to be as part of our uh, public hearing is um, the ordinance in general, but also public weigh in on whether six square feet, nine square feet, 14 square feet is the uh, right size. So we can just schedule a work session if, if you're interested. The work session before the, the public before hearing. Before your public hearing. So the, council, the Planning Commission would have yeah. public hearing, recommendation. We could then schedule a work session with the council before it goes for public hearing for you. And, and the, uh, the notion of what the right square feet would be tr um, identified as an issue for the for the Planning Commission. Sure. To discuss. Yep. Okay. The other that uh, makes sense to me. issue I've, I've heard about, <coughs> and I don't know what happens right now, Let, uh, they were talking about the, the kind of signs where the, what is it, college students who paint houses, signs that get plopped college pro. everywhere. Yeah. Another college pro. <coughs> Massively. What would that do to that? Um, this none of these changes would allow that um, if a property owner wanted to allow those folks to put a sign on their property and the property owner didn't already have two signs the property could owner could allow that to happen or the property owner as it does now could just ignore that somebody stuck it on their property and do nothing uh, property owner could but if that was the third sign mm -hmm. on that piece of property and somebody made a complaint to the city then the city would follow up with the property owner to say hey you have three signs you're only allowed two it which cool. might cause the property owner to take the sign down okay. and the public right away is not affected that's it's all that's still, still in effect right yeah, none of these changes affect that part. Which don't, we don't seem to get many complaints about now. Yes. Um, one more comment was, um, in reading the Guard article today, there was some comment that our sign code was actually content-based, and I just wanted to correct that, uh, if anybody had that impression, because our sign code, the way I read it and the way that it's interpreted, is not content-based. It's about location and size, and, and um, it doesn't have anything to do with what it says on the song. Um, I know the, the ACL, I know the ACLU said <laughs> something thought differently, but I, I, did, I don't think that that's the case. I don't think our sign code ever had the intent to um, regulate content. A long time ago, actually, it did, and the council made changes 15 or 20 years ago okay. in order to, you know, like, for example, a real estate sign, that exemption, it 
20 years ago, it used to say a sign could go up saying your property's for sale. That language was changed, although there's still an exemption titled real estate sign. If you look at the language, at the actual exemption, it's, it says something more like um, if your property is for sale, you can put up a sign, not more than 14 square feet. It doesn't say the sign has to say your property's for sale. The ACLU <laughs> looked at the title, didn't look at the actual language of the exemption. When Jerry and I had the conversation with the ACLU, we kept saying, forget the title, look at what the exemption actually is. It is not content-based. The way we're proposing to make these changes, um, it removes any doubt as to whether this is content-based. Right. Right. That's a good change, but I didn't think it regulated content in the first place. But. Okay, I think you're ready to vote on D. All those in favor, please indicate. Seven in favor and none in opposition. It passes. Thank you. So that leaves us with the pledge and the public forum for our meeting in just a few minutes. Cool. Right. And I have a business opportunity.